All right. Well, I, first let me say it's a great honor to uh, have been invited uh, to speak to you all. I'm a little nervous about being around so many judges. I try to avoid judges. Um, and I, I have to make the disclaimer that I am not an expert on uh, drug safety or FDA regulation, but I do have a broader interest in the more global topic of industry interface with medicine. And I, an, an article in your, in your uh, handout there sort of describes uh, something about that. But innovation is, uh, and, and the drug industry is a part of that topic, and so uh, I, I took the bait and I'm here. Now I guess Sid and I agree that the, the, the question that was posed is the wrong question that uh, the, the, the only state of absolute safety is death. And the, the real, um, even some placebos can sometimes uh, have bad effects. So the, 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 the real question is value. What is the value, and the value at what price, and at what cost, and at what risk? Now, uh, Dr. Wolf, is, is, I'm, I think this is, provides an important social good. I'm glad he sues the FDA. I'm glad that he's on the lookout uh, for ad adverse events that have been, been missed. Um, and, but what's really striking is that I think it was a pretty complete list of accomplishments from the public citizen group, but it goes back over 30 years and it's, well, it's pretty small. So. The, the, to some the extent that some of those were low life scum sucking bad things, uh, that, that's good. And but put them in. A, we need to put them in a context. Now I'm going to try to do that with you, with you for my based on my very long sojourn in medicine. I started out in medicine 40 years ago as an intern at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Now, the Mass General had just been elected number one hospital in America by the Ladies' Home Journal. And I had some amazing mentors. I, a couple of these folks went on to win Nobel Prizes. Others became leaders in American medicine. I was the control. Um, but despite all of those luminaries and the high esteem in which the hospital was held, we practiced dreadful, unsafe medicine by today's standards. If you can imagine, a patient with a heart attack came in the hospital and lay on the ward for a month, and we had first had them lie in bed, then we'd have them sit up for a week, then we'd have them put their, the walk around for a week, and then sit in a chair for a week. Can you imagine what that would cost at today's prices? And you know, we gave out Darvon like candy. I didn't even know people were still using Darvon. So uh, it, it, it was, and, and, and uh, 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 Scott this morning talked about the advances against HIV, but w w things are just so amazingly better today. The, he didn't talk about cardiovascular disease. Your risk of keeling over from a heart attack is 50% less than when I started out. And so by taking my statin, uh, I actually have a finite chance of maybe actually seeing the Cubs win the World Series someday. And uh, Scott talked about this, the cancer thing, you know, the death rate's one per person. So you fall out of the, uh, the cardiovascular box, you gotta go somewhere, you gotta die of something. Number two causes cancer, and as you can see, it's flat and going down, and actually it's going down. So what does this all do to? It's not because of all the great regulation we've had, it's because of the innovation that industry has produced working with physicians and on its own. So the question, to me is how can we promote that? Now Scott Penn spent a lot of time this morning talking about the process of innovation and, I, and, he, and he talked about the cost and the difficulty. And, but I wanna say that as someone who tries to innovate in medicine, that the randomness, nonlinearity, serendipity is in fact even worse than he indicated. Nature is a bitch. And he talked about Louis Pasteur. So let me give you an example there. So, so Pasteur is trying to prove germs cause disease. So he has assistants shooting up chickens with cholera. And the chickens are keeling over and dying. So one day the assistant comes up and says, uh, Professor Pasteur, I got bad news here. We had this really grody cholera. We gave it to these chickens and they're just sitting in their rocking chairs laughing at us. So, Pasteur, being a brilliant guy, he didn't, didn't shoot himself, he didn't shoot the assistant. He said, where'd you get the chickens? Well, budget's been a little tight, so we used some chickens from last month's experiment. 
Ah, get fresh chickens. Fresh chickens, they croaked immediately. That's how immunology started. So we had vaccines, and the idea was to cure all infectious diseases with vaccines. How many vaccines came after that? About five. And it took another century before the next vaccine arrived. So this is an extremely difficult nonlinear process that needs to be nurtured in a way and have as few obstacles put in its way. Now let me give you some, another example. I mentioned statins. I would argue that statins is probably one of the most major contributors to the decline in cardiovascular disease and on balance one of the most benign interventions in the history of medicine aside from vaccines. Now what you should realize is we almost didn't get them. Merck brought the first statin to market called Mevacor, but it had dropped its program for three years after a Japanese company that had the first statin uh, was, got worried about some safety issues. So it lay fallow at Merck for three years until a, a, a champion brought it back, did extensive toxicity testing, and then it was approved on the basis of its cholesterol-lowering property in 1987. Now it took seven years after that to, to complete a clinical trial that showed it actually reduced heart attacks and strokes. Now one of the, in the current ambient concern about safety, there is a lot of call to not use surrogate measures to approve drugs, which in this case was done, lowering cholesterol. Nobody knew for sure. I mean, now we know that lower cholesterol is good for you. Back then, we weren't sure. It was controversial. But thank goodness that the FDA allowed that approval because that seven year, in that seven years, a lot of people's lives were, were arguably saved. So then this is a blockbuster drug and other companies get into the market and we start getting more uh, statins. And some people argue that we should delay the approval of so-called Me Too drugs. Well, if that had happened, we wouldn't have had Lipitor, which is more potent than Mevacor and other drugs, the other statins that came along. And uh, some of my colleagues said, well, maybe you don't need to lower cholesterol uh, as, as far as Lipitor can do it. And they designed a study, and the study showed what we now know is that you can't be too rich, can't be too thin, and can't have too low a cholesterol. Then along comes Crestor, which I think you guys aren't particularly, haven't been particularly happy about. Um, and I think there was some delay in the approval and in the, in the, um, uh, in the, in the sales. But Within the past year, there have been some stunning studies showing that even with what currently is the card-carrying definition of a normal cholesterol, if you have a marker of inflammation, and inflammation is a big piece in the vascular disease that causes heart attacks and strokes, that with that parameter, if you have an elevated inflammation marker, you take Crestor, uh, you uh, have a lower, the study was stopped because the, the statistical significance was so high. So thank goodness we have Me Too drugs. If the first statin had been the Baycall that had to be recalled, we probably would have been stuck with it if there had been a delay in the approval of uh, follow-on drugs. So how, how can I jibe the, the, the wonderful progress we've made with all the difficulties that I'm moaning and groaning about here? And I, I think it's a question of where do, we, where, where do we want the choice to be? Are we, do, do we err on the side of facilitating innovation or do we err on the side of preventing side effects? Ideally, we would like to do both, but our society doesn't have the resources. And most importantly, I guess where I differ from Sid is that I view, I, I am very humble about my cognitive abilities and the ability to predict in the future what value, what work value, what value the work we do is going to bring. That when bad things happen, it's not because of bad intentions, uh, and if there, were, if there were just, an, it's not just that if there were enough attorneys general to bring culprits before you, that we would have a perfect world. I think most bad outcomes, like Vioxx, are more due to inadvertent error and assumptions that turn out to be wrong that no one could predict than due to veniality. So with that, I'll subside, and uh, I guess we're going to have some questions.